rolling. Good. These past few weeks and months, we've had the great pleasure of sitting down with Mr. Barrington Hares, or Clever Barry as we know him, to look at his incredible Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, fifth scale but perfect in every detail. Barry is without question the world's greatest living model engineer, and he's given us access to his private photo collection so we can see what goes on inside this masterpiece, and masterpiece it really is. But then there's his Eagle 22 engine, which is even more complicated, twice the size, two engines in one effectively, and yet every last component has been meticulously reproduced. And this brings us to the big one, because unlike the Merlin, the Eagle has never run. And we're going to find out now, for once and for all, and from Barry, whether he's going to start this engine. And we join Barry as we're about to discuss the starter motor, which runs on 2-2 rifle rounds, of all things. And I think, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the Eagle was a cartridge start system. Yes. And it had a sequencing motor to fire the cartridges. Is that right? Yeah, it's just... And you've chambered the Eagle. You're going to like this bit, everyone. For two two rifle rounds. Yeah. With a motor. with one of them buzzy things out of the phone. Yeah. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was chambered for two two long rifle cartridge. Uh -huh. But in actual fact, when you... Uh, I got to the stage of doing the gearing on it. In no way was that going to take the load. No. So it was never used. Yeah. But it still exists. You still yeah. thought it all yeah. through. And I presume made all the stuff to fire oh, up the car. Oh, it'll still index electrically. Yeah. Um, With the little motor from the phone. Yeah, the thing that goes. Zzz, zzz, zzz. Yeah. So that takes the cartridges. Yeah. How many of those is there? It's like a little Gatling gun, isn't it? There's, yeah, it's uh, six. Six. It's like, it's like a revolver, isn't it? It's about the last thing you'd expect, isn't it? Start your engine with rifle rounds, but it's just typical Barrington Hayes. If you look at, if you look at the, um, the motors that were in some of the earlier mobile phones, they're only about a quarter inch diameter. Tiny little motors. <laughs> yeah, I know that. But how did you take a drive off one of those? I mean, what, what did you, you know, you take it out the phone, quarter inch diameter motor. Yeah. How did you get a drive off that to do anything? We're just making gears. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I should. <laughs> Should have thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I was lucky enough in being able to get hold of documentation on the Kaufman starter, uh, which is still around at the time. Yeah. Whether it's still about now, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that was, we had a lot of that with Bluebird, where yeah. when we, we did it just at the right time, because there was a lot of people in industry that had been at their desks for that length yeah. of time. They'd been yeah. there in 67 or earlier and they'd seen Campbell and they were still at their desks. Yeah. And this was the era before you got, you know, fill out an online form and some youth will yeah. read it and get back to you if it makes sense to them. You had a lot of people who had been at their desks a long, long time, were very influential, very knowledgeable. But you also had a lot of the old facilities were still able to give us support. Yeah. So when it came to the fuel system, because the likes of the Vulcan was still flying, it still used the same Lucas, Lucas fuel system or similar the support for that equipment still existed. It doesn't yeah. now. Yeah. You know, it's we could now. take that equipment to whoever that does gas turbines mm. and they'd look at this old hydromechanical stuff and say, sorry, can't help you. We got in just in time, yep. just. Well, going back to the Merlin, when I was doing that, the Carl Vetter obviously with SU, and SU was still in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I went over there, saw an old chap, I forget his name now, but he remembered all the research work on the carburetors. He took me a little storage place where it was full of all the old drawings relating to all the aircraft as well as the, the Merlin. And that was on the point of being destroyed. Yeah. Well, I was let loose in the archive in the cellar mm. underneath what was Rolls-Royce controls and data, yep. which had been um, Lucas's um, gas turbine equipment. Yeah from 1939 or whenever it was, and everything was down there. And likewise with the hydraulics, Goodrich control systems yeah. had the original archive for the rapid start for the Vulcan and all the rest of it, which they allowed us to use. And I said, please, can we use this? And they said, no, it's a high pressure air system. It's dangerous. And I said, look, I'm a diver. I swim around the bottom of the sea with a high pressure air system on me, but I know what I'm doing. And eventually we got, but that archive I believe is gone. Yeah. I believe that's gone now. Yeah. Um, it's amazing what has been destroyed. Yeah, yeah, we got there just in time. Yeah, literally just in time. Here's a one. I've always wondered this. I know I've not asked you this one. On the very front of the eagle, there's a teeny tiny little hydraulic pipe with a ninety fitting, and it goes. It's up on the top of the. 
straight through the block, they're oil passages. Yeah. And that takes you from the one end onto the uh, reduction gear. Right, because that is one of my very, very favourite things. Yeah. That there. Yeah, that little pipe. Yeah, what's that? What's that do? That feeds, there's an oil gallery runs right the way through the crankcase. Right. Runs front to back. And that takes oil from that um, oil gallery uh, and takes it onto the, the, I think it's the front gear of the uh, the idler gear, the front bearing of the idler gear right. for the two speed or the two direction uh, uh, propellers. And is that a proper little pipe that oil goes down? Yeah. It's, it's not faked up on the engine? It takes the oil, yeah. It yeah, it's, it's a genuine pipe, yeah. 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 Well, I knew it would be. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, all, all the oil pipes on that were made by, um, I think from memory, they were conventional uh, plastic tubing inside uh, um, a stainless braid. Right. And what about the water pipes with all the little twin hose clips on them? Did mm. you make the clips or did you? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Repetition, boring? Again, repetition. Yeah, yeah. Because I love those water pipes, all the little yeah. clips are. And the little, there's a little bracket sticks off the frame yeah. that holds it. And you must have sat and machined that from solid. I mean, how long did that take? Just that yeah. one little teeny, you know the thing I mean? <laughs> with the bolts in it, yeah? That's beautiful. Obviously, with a lot of the oil pipe connections and that, the detailed fittings of the oil connections are not as original. But I've just done whatever fittings I could, uh, I could really make up. Yeah. Um, and then obviously it would have been too fiddly. Obviously, because yeah. none of it was fiddly. <laughs> <laughs> and then the um, the little gearbox thing at the back, because that's not part of the eel. I'm doing this. Okay. Oh, that, that's yeah, that's me. What, the little gearboxy thing. That should be rotating. Let's have a look. Yeah. Yep, that's rotating. That's not a part of the engine. Is that's just a little gearbox? Well, I'm saying just a little gearbox thing you made. It's not like everybody would make one. That, even the little strainery things in the ends, a little teeny tiny fine mesh in there, it's ridiculous. Well, that's obviously the same generator as is on there. Yeah, that's got one as well, hasn't it? Yeah, down there. Look at that. And the, the air pump, the vacuum pump's the same. And the, uh, the air compressor's the same. Oh, that's just gorgeous, that little air compressor. I didn't know until well, I saw... these bloody things now, they're fetching four and five hundred quid a ton. <laughs> Full size ones, you mean? Yeah. What? Yeah, that was uh, that was fitted to the wyvern. Um, I th it wasn't part of the engine as such, but it was to take a drive from the back of the um, of the gear case uh, to the auxiliary box, as it was, and then it was um, capable of taking anything in the way of hydraulic pump, air compressor, anything, or could have screwed onto whichever flames I wanted. So did you get the drawings for that as all that got its internals in as well? I must have had the original drawings of that from memory. But it's got all its yeah. gubbins inside, yeah. yeah. Now I knew that was a stupid question the second I asked it. Of course it has all its bits inside. When did Barry build anything that didn't have all its bits inside? But what's even more amazing about this is that he didn't have to build it. It's not part of the Eagle engine. Apparently it's a fairly standard gearbox that Merlin Pete recognised at once as being one you can stick on any aircraft that engine you like and it means you can drive any accessories you like without molesting the engine itself. So yeah, it has all its bits in. There's that little universal joint. There's pipes made from hypodermic tubing as ever. There's bearings that were probably off the shelf but not quite right so then every likelihood Barry's made new cages for them or something clever and exotic like that. Yes, it has all its internals. And when you get a closer look, it doesn't get any simpler. How do you cut gears like that? I have no idea. And then there's the accessories, the air compressor, vacuum pump, hydraulic pump. They've all got their internals in as well. It really is quite staggering. But this is, uh, the, the Eagle's never run, has it? Mm. It's never, you've never started that one. Um, it, it, what, sorry? You've never actually started the Eagle. No, engine, it's, no. Uh, when I came to uh, putting it all together, uh, I left the plugs out, put um, a two to one um, belt drive onto the crank, onto the prop shaft and ran a three quarter horse motor and it burned out the bloody motor with that much restriction to it. Right. So I thought, no, in no way is this going to start properly. <laughs> Stiff as a board. Wow.
But all the bits inside are going up and down and round and round and the sleeves moving and everything. That was making nice sucky noises before when you were turning it. Yeah. If anybody can hear that. Go and do it again, Barry. <laughs> I can smell oil coming out the pot. I can smell the oil coming out. It's yeah. obviously sat there all this time. Still nice and lubricated and everything free. Yeah. That's fantastic. That really is. I mean, you know what I'm like for these things. This is the, I've never been this close to it. Little Rolls Royce thing down there. I don't know if you can see it. It's Rolls Royce on there. It's tremendous. You should try and get this one started, Barry. Get the finger pins off it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should have a go getting this started. I know you're not that keen, but... But as I say, the amount of friction on this... It doesn't look as bad. You know, you've told me about the friction all this yeah. time. It doesn't look as bad as I'd imagined it. No. Well, if you want to have a go at getting it going, I'll round up a few of the troops to do the lifting. We'll get it out in the garden, see if we can get a <laughs> tune out of it. Be good to see it run. Yeah. I bet you'd like to see it run. No, I think you should bike uh, to back the gears. I think up. it would smash itself to pieces. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the beauty with that, it's so simple. There's no other gear in it. Oh, yeah, there's nothing to it, is there? Yeah. No. <laughs> and in fact, in total, when you think about it, the drive on the on the shafts that drives the, sh the sleeves would have been far too high. I think it would have been sheer them. And that was what was happening on the full size. Yeah. Because they're just the little little pins, aren't they? That, yeah. That drive the sleeves. Yeah, yeah. On the, what you have between on each cylinder, between the upper and lower uh, sleeves, there's a, a long shaft with helical gears on it mm -hmm. that drives uh, cross shafts with two cranks on a crank for each cylinder. Yeah. Um, and then that, as I said, the six of those on each in each bank. Uh, Opposite hand to the front three to the rear three, so there's no in theory there's no end thrust on it. Mm. But the total load on the shaft is incredible. Yeah, there's a lot of resistance on those sleeves. Yeah, yeah. For people who don't know what a sleeve valve engine, you basically got your cylinder bore with another cylinder bore inside of it, mm. and little doors cut, and the sleeve valve goes up yeah, and round and up and round. The sleeve valve is oscillated by a crank. Yeah, driving a pin on the bottom. But it, it rotates and it, 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 it moves, moves up and down and round and round, so it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So what you're saying is the little pin that drives the sleeve round and up and down, that, yeah. that's going to be way over stressed, yeah. even on the full size engine. Well, essentially it's a pin with um, a, a ball drive on it, uh, so you have flexible uh, sort of um, drive. The bottom, I think, from memory, the pin is on the sleeve, then the ball on the pin, and it's a, a sophetical end on the end of the crank though. So you have the complete rotational movement. Yeah. But the friction load on the, all the sleeves is, is quite high. Yeah, well I, I know when people try to strip down the, the, um, the Bristol Hercules and Centaurus engines, that's the big yeah. problem, is trying to get the sleeves to move within, because they're yeah. such a close fit. Yeah. And they're different materials as well, aren't they? You've got a, yeah. But what's the outer? Is the outer steel and the inner phosphor bronze on? As it happens, here is a Bristol Hercules, which is also a sleeve valve engine. And there's a sleeve wiggling around. It'll be on its cam drive. And that's one of the ports. Bit rusty, but you get the idea. You've got conventional piston rings on the piston. Yeah. But then around the bottom of the sleeve, and the bottom of the cylinder, there's a contracting ring. Right. Um, so altogether, the friction between what in total you've got six rings on each cylinder. Yeah, so it's got quite a, a high load. Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, it is unlikely that this masterpiece will ever run or feel the heat of combustion. But you have to accept and respect Barry's decision that he doesn't want his life's work to smash itself apart internally because he's built it so perfectly and so faithfully that it's inherited all the problems of the full-size engine. But don't for one second think it couldn't run, in theory, because it has every last part inside of there to make that possible. So here's a montage of some of the parts you've not seen yet. While you're still here, 
Coming up in the next few weeks, I recently had a unique opportunity to sit down with two of the senior investigators from the Lockerbie disaster for a, a very candid fireside chat, and that is fascinating. I went to see one of the UK's top race engine builders to get an engine sorted out for the Ford RS200 rebuild and we got a good look around his workshop. And a couple of weeks back, Merlin, Pete and I visited with Clever Barry to ask him all those questions that came up in the comments. So if you enjoy this content, don't forget to subscribe, tell us what you think in the comments and thank you as ever for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Enjoy Barry's engine. So, Barry, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. For your time. Yeah. It's, it's good to get it on record. <laughs> yeah, we'll get it on record. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Cheers, matey. <laughs> hey, there's the dog. Hello, dog. Hello. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is Gibson the dog. <laughs> But famous, famous for winning trophies for obedience. You'll be edited out, you're okay. <laughs> Yay, you just made the outtakes. <laughs>